Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Joy Shupendra Kumar uh, uh, from the PRAYAS team. I'm an assistant professor in radio diagnosis in JJ Medical College, Tavangere, and uh, a warm welcome to uh, you all uh, for today's uh, session of uh, radiology web class on the PRAYAS forum. Uh, today, the topic is the radiographic physics uh, table by essentials part two. We will continue from where Dr. Satinder had left in the previous class and uh, we'll just try to cover a few things. And the scope is uh, like uh, today, we'll, be try uh, we'll cover beam restrictors, filters, uh, radiographic films, intensifying screens, developer, fixer, and a few things more. Uh, before we actually start, uh, uh, the specifics of into the specifics of the table by essentials we should know certain things which are commonly asked what exactly happens when x-rays pass through the tissue okay so here where uh, 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 there are some questions related to uh, the intensity of the x-rays what can happen so these are the three things that can happen so diagnostic, if the X-ray beam is in the diagnostic range, like uh, mean energy of 20 to 50 uh, electron volts, so they interact and attenuate. So the X-rays get attenuated in the tissue. Most of it is photoelectric effect. So when we talk in terms of attenuation, it is photoelectric effect. And uh, or the second thing can happen. They can just interact and scatter. So it's called Compton effect. So Compton scatter. So the scattering, if you uh, we are talking about the scattered radiation, it's Compton effect, it's attenuation, it's mostly photoelectric effect. Okay. So what if the, there are very high energy uh, X-rays? So they, they just pass through. And uh, or if it is very high in the range of uh, minimum of 1.02 mega electron volts or or more than 10 mega electron volts, depending on what is the energy, definitely they will undergo something called pair production, which is the basis of PET scan and, and photo disintegration to produce uh, alpha rays and other particles. So what if they are very low energy in the range of less than 10 kilo electron volts? So that is where coherent scattering comes in. And uh, basically here nothing happens. The, there is just change in the direction and uh, they get absorbed. So this, uh, this uh, coherent scattering occurs in almost 5% at diagnostic energy ranges of X-rays. So it's a very favorite question, what is scatter radiation? Before that, what is attenuation? I told you it's uh, basically the photoelectric effect. What exactly happens is when the incident X-ray is of the energy very close to the binding energy of the innermost shell electron. Okay, when, when the energy is slightly more than the innermost shell electron binding energy, so that the X-ray will interact with this particular electron. This electron is released. So this is called a photoelectron. And then uh, energy is released when the electron in the next particular shell jumps here to take its position. So this is at a higher energy. This is at a lower energy. So when this jumps here, there is a certain amount of energy released, which is the characteristic radiation and this is very characteristic because the same energy is released from one particular atom okay so it is dependent on that particular atom so every atom has its own characteristic energy and that is why it is called characteristic radiation and this is what is uh, what happens is most of the characteristic uh, characteristic radiation in the soft tissues is of the range of two to four uh, kilo electron volts. So they all get absorbed within the body. So that is why I say when it is photoelectric effect, the, the body absorbs. So photoelectric effect, one thing is, as the body absorbs the radiation, whichever pass through, whichever X-rays pass through outside the tissue, they give very good contrast to the image. Okay, so photoelectric effect gives very good contrast to the image but increases the patient radiation dosage. And this occurs at a very low energy, at about 25 to 45 kilo electron volts. And uh, if you want to know what is the KVP at which, uh, at which this particular energy is generated, it's around 40 to 70 KVP. So most of photoelectric effect occur in this particular range. And definitely this is what the principle that is used when we do a contrast study like barium study or use iodine in a CT scan or uh, yeah. fluoroscopy. So this is the basis. Because the characteristic 
strict radiation liberated by barium and iodine or slightly of a higher energy range which are not easily attenuated by the body tissue so they can still reach the receptor detector so and most important question i have come across in the last uh, three years uh, whenever i uh, just was uh, attending an exam was what is scatter radiation scatter radiation is uh, uh, basically it is a compton effect that gives rise to scatter radiation any radiation which is of no use to the final image formation and actually only adds uh, ghosting or a fogging effect which is of actually of no use okay so it's not a useful radiation so this is what is called scatter radiation and this most often is due to compton effect and uh, what happens is when the diagnostic energy range x-ray hits the outer shell electron so here it's the outer shell electron so most of the uh, it, it this particular electron requires very less energy to move out so uh, most of the energy is still retained in this uh, by this uh, x-ray photon which is a scattered x-ray and this electron is again absorbed by the body tissue so this is what is compton effect so it will form a film fog and increase the patient radiation dose because you have uh, that's what and next is factors which affect the scatter, scatter radiation one is these are the three most important factors yeah the field size so the, the larger the field size that we are aiming at the more is the scatter radiation so the, there is a need to collimate there is a need to restrict and regulating and reducing the kvp as we said the lesser the kvp the lesser the scatter radiation and the part thickness part thickness we don't have control over because different patients come in different uh, thickness so the thicker the part the more is the scatter radiation so the, these three things among these three the first two we can regulate the third we can't do much about so one important thing here as the kvp increases in the diagnostic range the compton scatter increase and the photoelectric effect decreases okay most important so uh, what happens is the more uh, with the scatter radiation more photons reach the film also and it makes it darker also so both things are there so what do we do to reduce scatter if we have to increase the kvp better reduce the mas so that will take care of the scatter to some extent so how do we reduce scatter radiation beam restrictors grids beam restrictors will reduce the tissue irradiation or the field size what i was talking about the field size which is the most important thing uh, why scatter radiation occur the field size so that we can restrict by using a beam restrictor and it will also cause less patient dose so definitely the improve the image quality because less scatter reach, uh, radiation reach the film second one is the grids which dr satendra talked about in the previous class so it reduces scatter radiation reaching the film but it will not affect the patient dose because grids are kept after uh, in the uh, between the patient and the receptor uh, that is a film so it has nothing to do with the patient dose but definitely it will uh, reduce the uh, scatter radiation reaching the film so it will actually reduce the fog in fact grids may actually need more factors uh, uh, that is the kvp and mas so the patient dose may be actually more so first come to x ray beam restrictors what is the definition of x ray beam restrictor it's a device that is attached at the opening of the x ray tube most often it is uh, to the x ray tube housing and if you talk about cone or cylinder nowadays it, it is also attached to the uh, opening of the distal opening of the collimator i'll show you a video on that later so it is to regulate the size and shape of the x ray beam and all beam restrictors are made up of lead and copper okay so lead is important because if they have to attenuate the radiation and copper is definitely to make up the rest of the mass so these are the four types of uh, this thing what is important is yeah before we go to the cones so we'll just talk about something called penumbra because last exam there was a question on that uh, in a practical exam that i i just uh, was able to uh, witness so what is a penumbra it is a geometric unsharpness around the periphery of the image so this is the x ray source the focal spot x rays uh, uh, this is the anode so x rays are really uh, released here and see the focal spot uh, the this is the object okay this is the object and this is the receptor this is the focus for the more the distance the sharper the image okay so that's interesting right so the focal spot 
and the object the more the distance the sharper the image and see the here what is happening the distance is very less and there is see the, at the periphery so this is what is called penumbra it's a geometric unsharpness at the periphery so again what will happen with beam restrictors so let us assume that uh, the uh, the source object distance is okay but still uh, different beam restrictors are likely to cause some amount of penumbra so this is an aperture diaphragm which is nothing but a lead sheet with a hole in the center that is what is an aperture diaphragm it is the first and the simplest form of beam restrictor i have not seen it being kept in a table viva but just to cover it i am just telling this so this is the this is the uh, anode again this is the aperture diaphragm see the penumbra so large is the penumbra right so what has happened with cylinder see the cylinder the wider radiation is attenuated so the penumbra reduces so that is what is the concept so when beam restriction takes place closer to the anode target or if the source object distance is less penumbra is better more in aperture uh, sorry penumbra is more it and it happens more in aperture diaphragms and cones than in cylinders cylinders will give a less less penumbra so to minimize the penumbra we have to use more cylinders either or we can do uh, we can place a beam restrictor away from the as away from the target as possible increase the source object distance and make a small effort uh, small use of smaller focal spot so what is this yeah this is a cone so, so when we when we come across this we uh, they will ask you what is this you have to tell this is a x ray beam restrictor device cone okay so it's as simple as that it has two ends one is the tube end see this this is the tube end the flared portion is towards the patient or the object so this is the object end this is the tube end so tube end has a base so it can which can easily fit into the uh, external opening of the collimator or the x-ray tube housing this is how it is fit this is the collimator and the cone is fixed the flared end is towards the patient the most commonly asked question which one is the tube end which one is the patient end okay so this is the collimator outer housing and here are the uh, this thing for uh, where the cones get fixed into okay so this base they are just fixed here so this is what is a radiographic cone so what happens so cone has a flare shape the flare of the cone actually it's if you can if you had noticed this flare is much larger so penumbra is definitely there so there's some amount of image unsharpness still there uh, so the flare of the cone is larger than the flare of the x-ray beam and the base of the cone uh, here the base of the cone is the narrowest part so it causes maximum restriction of the beam so uses it's used in pns radiography uh, lumbar sickle spine when we are thinking of, when we when we want the l5 s1 cone down view very commonly uh, done to look for any listhesis and orbits uh, internal auditory canal temporomandibular joint these are a few things where cones are used similarly next one is a cylinder so cylinder see the there is a uniform uh, uh, diameter of the cylinder and there is no flare as we saw so the maximum restriction of the beam occurs here again there is a base plate which is towards the tube so this is the tube end and this is the patient end so this is the uh, cylinder so as the restri beam restriction occurs more distally there is very little penumbra so usually cylinder is used uh, in a small part radiography like a mastoid or a cell a very focal uh, uh, anatomy so and tmg again this can be used and next uh, so we completed the so we know uh, cone and a cylinder and what is the difference between the two where they are used so next is collimator so this is the most frequently used and uh, most useful uh, beam restrictor device because as we could make out in the previous the shape of the cone makes that cone and the cylinder make that uh, the field is uh, always uh, fixed we can't change the field size or the shape anything but uh, what comes with a collimator is something different so this i have directly taken it from the textbooks these two images this is from christiansen the simplest of uh, way to explain a collimator so this particular square is the collimator so these are the shutters so it works on the principle of shutters there are and there is a filter also here so important where is the filter placed so it's almost somewhere in uh, uh, in the collimator or uh, closer to the tube housing okay so it's upper part of the collimator here this is the mirror which has a uh, silver coating on the back surface there is a light bulb okay important 
and so this is the simplest of the diagrams that you can draw for your exams also so what happens is there is a bulb why bulb is required why light is required because we can't see the x-ray beam so when we have to adjust the uh, the field of view so we use a, a light beam so this is exactly what we are doing so a light bulb is here we can't keep it in the pathway so we have kept it somewhere to the side and which is reflected from this particular mirror towards the object so and this is around 45 degrees in angle and most important thing here is the distance between the bulb and the mirror and the focal spot and the mirror should be same okay otherwise the the x-ray beam uh, size and the light beam size will not match so that is the whole idea so these distances should be the same and this is the same 3d representation again of a collimator these are the upper shutters lower shutters the x-ray and uh, sorry the light bulb the mirror and this is the tube okay so collimator is fixed at the this is the x-ray tube this is the collimator okay collimator can be detached and kept it in a table by it's very simple to detach it also okay so collimators they also have a calibrated scale in the front of the collimator so that you can uh, adjust the film size based upon that at least two pairs of shutters are there and unlimited sizes of fields you can generate so that is the most important thing we can have various sizes of fields so there's something called automatic collimators this question was asked uh, has re repeatedly asked in the table viva what are these positive beam limiting devices not they are nothing they are very simple collimators which are which uh, run motorized basically so when you keep a uh, they can be easily basically when you keep a film uh, and uh, the motor driven collimators adjust the uh, beam size based on the film size it's as simple as that uh, not frequently seen though in our country and there is a small test that you can do to check whether the alignment of the light beam and x-ray beam is correct or not take a large 1417 film put for these these are the four uh, yeah, take a place of film in the cassette obviously you have to load the unexposed film in the cassette and then uh, place four uh, metal uh, uh, what do you call pins here at the four corners of the first you will have to switch on the light uh, light source in the collimator so it will give you some uh, um field so at the corners you try and uh, fix these uh, metal uh, clips and then take a first shot okay so and after that just open the collimators again okay Co open the collimators more and then take the second shot without changing the position of the cassette okay that's very important so first thing is switch on the light okay adjust call narrowed on the collimators place the pins at the edges of the x-ray uh, beam then take an x-ray then just widen the collimator shutters and take another one so you'll get this image okay and the the darker center is the x-ray beam fov and this is what so there is a some misalignment here so this is exactly what you will get and this is how you can do a test and uh, there is something called post patient collimator frequently asked in exams it is usually seen as it's in all ct scanners the collimators are placed in front of the detectors much behind the patient so it is not in front of the patient as we see in conventional radiography it is beyond the patient you close to the detector so this is called as post patient collimator and this is uh, and this actually also uh, uh, is the reason why we can change the slice thickness of acquisition and all other things and just uh, these are not seen being kept in table viva just for completion aperture diaphragms i already told simplest so sheet of lead with a hole in the center wide penumbra so beam restrictors fewer photons reach the patient obviously because most of them are restricted by the so fewer reach the film so we may have to increase the factors to some extent so the question is uh, the examiner asked the student whether there is any need for alteration of factors if you are using a beam restrictor you have to tell yes there is a need because most of excess is absorbed so you have to increase the factors but still the increase in factors will also not uh, increase the patient dose because still they are most of them are again uh, uh, absorbed so and cone cylinders and aperture diaphragms the problem is limited field sizes and shapes so next coming to the next one so then there are kept a small plate like sort of metallic plate sort of a thing and this is what is this uh, the examiner will ask you it is just a radiographic filter okay 
So this is an aluminium filter. Obviously, we keep aluminium filters more often. Uh, so what are these filters? So these are sheets of metal. They are placed in the pathway of the X-ray, very close to the tube. I showed you where they are placed, very in the collimator upper part, and uh, uh, very close to the tube housing. What the what is their role? They absorb the low energy radiation. So when uh, X-ray, uh, there are uh, there is a very wide range of uh, uh, energies in a particular X-ray beam. So the lower energy is not required. They only increase the patient dose. So what the filters do is they will absorb those low energy. So the primary effect of uh, filters is to reduce patient dosage. And one more thing is they also shape the beam because now the lower energy radiation are absorbed. So only the mean energy of the X-ray increases. So it also improves image quality. So these are the two things. The most important thing is reduce patient dose. And the second one is improve the image contrast. So uh, there is something called uh, Aluminum equivalent, I'll come to the next slide. So before that, uh, what is the, there is a recommendation we need to know. It's around 2.5 millimeter thickness of aluminum is required uh, for any X-rays that we do for more than 70 uh, kilovolt peak. So what is inherent filtration? So filtration also occurs uh, inherently without actually having to keep a aluminum plate in the pathway. So this is called inherent filtration. This is This happens in the tube and its housing. So what are responsible for it? The glass envelope of the tube itself has a, a filtration effect. The insulating oil surrounding the envelope, the glass envelope, the window in the tube housing. So these are the three things which uh, cause the inherent filtration effect uh, in the tube itself. So this is called inherent filtration, which every X-ray tube will have. Most of the effect is from the glass envelope. Please remember this. And all this uh, filtration is measured in aluminum equivalent. So what is it? It's the thickness of aluminum that produces the same attenuation of the X-rays as thickness of any other, if you are any other material. So if you are using a different material, whatever the uh, if, uh, this thing, attenuation it is causing, you just compare it with the thickness of aluminum that is be using the standard charge and you'll get an aluminum equivalent. So the inherent filtration is around 0.5 to 1 millimeter aluminum equivalents and most of it is from the glass envelope. So again, uh, just to show the, uh, this is the inherent filtration that's that i was uh, talking about the focal spot this is the glass envelope but, uh, see this is a thinner glass envelope here uh, compared to the other parts whether it is much thicker this was the question that was asked uh, to me by my teacher during my post graduation and i failed to answer so the the glass is not uniform in thickness okay so this part is thinner the, the exit port Okay, the glass envelope, the exit port here, it is thinner compared to the rest. So this also causes some amount of filtration. Then there is an insulating oil here and then the ex exit port. And again, uh, we have an additional or additional filter placed here, which is aluminum. Even the, the mirror also has an effect on filtration. So all this together. So what are the different materials that are used for filtration? Added filtration. Aluminum is the most common. Uh, atomic number, very important. 13. So what uh, does that mean is uh, it absorbs radiation. So aluminum will absorb the low energy radiation. So what will it absorb? How will it absorb? Again, photoelectric effect. So aluminum will absorb any X-ray radiation, which is very close to its binding energy of the casial electron. That's as simple as that. So the lesser the atomic number, the, uh, the energy of the X-rays that it can absorb is also lesser. So so only the high energy radiations are uh, left uh, to pass through and the lower energy radiations are absorbed. So this is very important. Okay, Again, this is photoelectric effect here. So the second most common that is used is copper, uh, atomic number 29. So the energy that it can absorb is slightly higher than the aluminum. Okay, So another important thing, it does not mean that aluminum will absorb all energy below a particular level. No, it doesn't happen actually. So it, it will absorb energy which is very close to its uh, binding energy of the uh, electron shells same with copper but copper will uh, slightly higher energy radiation uh, if you require a higher energy radiation better to use copper as simple as that and uh, uh, used with aluminium most often there is a combination of aluminium and copper so this is what is called a compound filter where the aluminium part is placed towards placed towards the patient and the copper part will be tube uh, towards the tube. So the high energy radiation first hits the copper, some energy is, uh, sorry, some radiation is, photoelectric effect takes place, 
and it releases characteristic radiation. This particular characteristic radiation is again absorbed by aluminium. And so the only the remaining part of the X-rays is uh, reaches the patient. So that is a, that's a dual effect there. So it's called a compound filter. And in molybdenum uh, is molybdenum is used in mammography. Uh, 42 is the atomic number. Why? Because uh, we, need, uh, we don't require any X-rays more than 20 to 25 kilo electron volts in mammography. So molybdenum is slightly higher in atomic number. Tries to reduce the uh, the higher energy. So it does. So what the important thing is all these metals will absorb or uh, attenuate uh, x-rays which are very close to the characteristic uh, uh, sorry uh, close to the binding energy of the electrons so uh, like aluminum will attenuate the low energy copper will only attenuate selectively uh, 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 mid energy levels and molybdenum slightly higher energy levels it will attenuate it but it will let the lower energy pass through so that is what is important and then we have uh, heavy metal filters, which are called KH filters also. Actually, KH filters is uh, uh, a confusion always. Even the compound filters are called KH filters because KH is nothing but uh, the characteristic energy that is uh, released by one metal is absorbed by the next metal. So that is what is the KH principle. So even the compound filters are also called KH filters. So heavy metal filters are especially like gadolinium, hol holmium. So the question is, Remember this, gadolinium is also used other than in MR, one of the uh, thing is here. It is a, used as a KH filter. So these are used basically when we are doing a barium or iodine studies, okay? Because uh, their energy, uh, there we require a very narrow beam of high energy to reach the X-ray uh, receptor to give us an image. So that's the idea. So in fluoroscopy, we generally use uh, gadolinium, holmium, so what are the advantages of KH filters? Uh, they transmit a narrower energy spectrum. They enhance the contrast for iodine and barium. They reduce the patient dose. Gadolinium and holmium are uh, the ones, but other compound uh, filters are also included as KH filters. There's something called wedge and trough filters. We should know about them. Uh, when, basically when the, uh, the thickness of the body part is not uniform, just to compensate, like we have a, we are doing a chest X-ray, we can use a trough filter because the mediastinum is very dense compared to the lungs on either side. So we need less energy to pass through the mediastinum and more, uh, uh, so, sorry, the more, more X-rays easily pass through the lungs and to reach the receptor, but the less and the less X-rays pass through the mediastinum because there is more attenuation in the mediastinum. So we can use a trough filter. Trough is nothing but it's thinner in the center and thicker in the periphery. So thinner means uh, it allows more X-rays to pass through. Thicker, it allows less X-rays to pass through. That's how they compensate. Wedge filters are uh, seen, uh, are used in uh, the one that, that are depicted here. They're all lead sheets, basically. Uh, they are used in uh, dorsal spine, feet X-rays, uh, lower limbs, conventional angiographies of the lower limbs. And last of the filters that we need to know is something called thorius filter. It's a compound filter in which three metals are used, tin, copper, and aluminum. Tin is towards the tube, aluminum is towards the patient, copper is in between. So the tin uh, characteristic radiations are absorbed by copper. And finally, aluminum absorbs the radiation by the copper. No specific uh, uh, use as a, it, it's basically a compound filter. Uh, it can be used as a compound filter in all places actually and no other specific uh, utility for this. So that was about uh, filters. So next we'll try and uh, see uh, about uh, films. I'm not showing you a film here because I'm sure that many of, uh, all of you have seen a conventional radiography film. So this is a, just a depiction of the different layers of uh, film. This I have taken it from another textbook, this image. So when you when you are shown a film, you have to call it a conventional radiography film or a receptor. So what are the layers of it? That's the question that will be asked. In the center, if obviously uh, when we do a chest X-ray or any other X-ray, most of the times we are using a double emulsion films. So this is what we have to say. So it's a double emulsion conventional radiography films unless you are shown a dental film, right, or a mammography film. Okay. Otherwise, this is all double emulsion radiographic conventional radiography film. So there is a base in the center, which is the thickest part, okay? Almost uh, 150 to 250 micrometers. 
and there is an uh, there is most important layer is the emulsion emulsion is there on either side okay so emulsion is the one which is most important and an emulsion is pasted or it is uh, held to the base by the help of an adhesive that's the reason it is meant both sides you have adhesion and then there is an emulsion and then there is a super coat which just protects they're all thin layers the most important layer is emulsion okay so we'll just discuss each one in detail base it's formed by polyester dimethyl terephthalate and ethylene glycol combination the base is the one which gives the color okay that's very important so uh, blue tint is usually used most of the x-rays conventional x-rays use a blue dye why because they reduce the eye strain uh, so if uh, someone asks you a question like uh, what is the color of the x-ray film uh, when it is not exposed also not developed also so basically it's in the packet and you have to guess what is it um, i am sure most of us um, many of us have not seen it and neither we can because we are doing it in the dark room the loading and unloading part so it's blue why because they add a blue dye to it okay so we can never see that blue film basically because we are only uh, handling it in the dark room so the properties of the base uh, very important they it should be a flexible but still tough it should be stable it should be uh, loosened so that uh, the x uh, the uh, x rays as well as the light photons can easily pass through and uh, activate the other emulsion on the other side of the base also so it should be loosened it should be inert because many uh, developer and big solutions will be coming and uh, the base should not create a havoc there by interacting with those uh, particular chemicals uh, instead of uh, forming the image and it has to be impermeable to water and it should be non flammable so adhesive and subbing layer the adhesive it's just a glue and it prevents bubbles distortion of film and folded it holds the base to the emulsion so a most important layer emulsion so emulsion contains uh, uh, most importantly silver halide grains or crystals which are suspended in gelatin most of it is silver bromide 95 to 98% only few crystals are of silver iodide Gel and they are uniformly distributed in the gelatin uh, component so gelatin is used in which they, uh, these crystals are suspended gelatin forms uh, gelatin is used to grow the crystals also in the how uh, emulsion is uh, formed it's, it's formed in a gelatin uh, uh, suspension basically so the, the the halide crystals are allowed to grow in a gelatin uh, suspension and gelatin maintains uniform distribution of the crystals it's neutral it again it has to be loosened it's a non reactive medium and it prevents clumping and silver halide all this is given in your chesney's radiography uh, physics book and uh, there is uh, we they had an impurity uh, by the name allyl thiourea so that the uh, during the this is during the process of developing an emulsion they had this actually allyl thiourea so this forms what is called silver sulfide which acts as a sensitivity spec so the question is uh, in the examiner will ask you what is a sensitivity spec so it's on the surface of a uh, emulsion which serves it's a point on the surface of an emulsion which serves as electrode to attract free silver ions and trap them so once they attract free silver ions and trap them this forms the latent image okay so two definitions here one is sensitivity spec the other one is latent image and also emulsion contains some chemical sensitizers fungicides bactericides and anticoagulants so this is how a silver uh, halide crystal will appear so this is bromide this is silver and this is one or two here and there uh, the iodide crystals sorry ions so we should know something called latent image formation so it's just aggregation of uh, first one or two silver atoms onto the sensitivity spec so this is what is this uh, flow chart is called gurney mott hypothesis okay so what happens how a latent image is formed x rays this is uh, or the light for most of one it's only the light from the screens that will uh, reach the bromine uh, ions which are negatively charged so so they uh, move about i mean uh, they energize the bromine which releases the electron excess electron it has this electron is attracted towards the sensitivity spec and this electron will further attract the positively charged silver okay ions which are roaming freely 
So this is what is called electron trapping. Okay, so the electron is first attracted to the sensitivity spec and it then traps the silver positive ion. Okay, and once this is trapped, the second atom is also trapped and then it forms a silver molecule. So once Ag2, right? So that is the latent image formation. So this aggregation, at least four or five such uh, aggregation of silver atoms are required to form uh, a visible image. So latent image is not visible, is the first one or two silver atoms uh, that are uh, aggregated at the sensitivity spec. So it's very important to know this. And then there's a super coat for the film, which is also again gelatin and it only it has a role of protection. So this is another question, important one. What are the film sizes available? What do we do with each film? 14, 17, large parts, abdomen, <coughs> KUB, abdomen, uh, 10, 12, then there is 12, 12, 15, all these are in inches, okay? I, I heard some students say centimeters the other day, it was very shocking, it is in inches. Please, we need to know all this. This is very, very basic. So these are the different sizes available. So types of films, there are many different types of films. So one is a direct exposure film or a non-screen single emulsion film. There is no screen at all, okay? There is no screen at all. So intensifying screen is not there and emulsion is also on one side of the base, okay? We saw the previous example uh, where there were uh, routinely that we have the films, they have emulsion on both sides of the base. Here it's only one side. They are used in dentals and forensic specimen radiography nowadays not much done but dental definitely yes and uh, then screen film screen film is what we were talking about till now the emulsion on both sides and then we, where we have to use an intensifying screen so they are again divided into different speeds uh, low speed, high speed, power speed, films also, and even the screens are also divided, divided on the same basis. So speed is nothing but the sensitivity of silver halide crystals, okay? And uh, the speed depends on the thickness of emulsion and size of the crystal. So the more the thickness of emulsion, the more is the speed, and the more is the size of the crystal, the more is the speed, okay? But less becomes the resolution, so that's the uh, other way. And again, screens, uh, these screen films can be monochromatic, sensitive to only one particular light, orthochromatic, sensitive to only one particular light. Again, polychromatic, they are sensitive to all colors of light. And single-sided emulsion and screen. So this is a third variety where there is a single-sided emulsion and also a screen to be used. So we'll come to that in the next slide. So there are some laser films, duplication films, subtraction films. Uh, in that again, we have mask and a subtraction, polaroid films, semi radiography. So just to know the names. So single ML coated film. In one of the exams, uh, I came across uh, my friend telling that the dental x-ray was kept there. So this, we need to know a little bit about that. So our uh, base is there, see it's a single coated film. So the base is there, the emulsion, is only on one side of the base. This is very important. And then there is a super coat. The other side, there is no emulsion. There is something called anti-curl or anti-halation layer. So what happens is as there is only emulsion on one side, this emulsion swells up when, during the developing process. So the film tends to curve like this. So to prevent that, this is something called anti-curl. Another problem is, uh, anti-halation anti-halation is uh, the light uh, reflection okay so this is the un uh, unsharpness uh, because of the reflection of light in the base okay so anti-curl is basically gelatin anti-halation is again one of the particular dyes that are used they are mixed together and put it so this is uh, both so how do we identify which one is the tube end so we cannot position it reverse okay very important in single coated film the emulsion end the that should be towards the patient is dull in to see it is very dull uh, milky okay and the other side is very shiny so the shiny side should be towards the opposite side okay it should be towards the opposite and uh, dull side is the patient side so this is very important or patient or the tissue side whatever the region of interest so film storage and handling very important there is an expiry date for every film this is another question that was asked uh, in one of the dnb exams that i happened to just uh, see so expiry date is there for film also very important 
and then stored uh, at uh, less than 20 degrees and they had to be sealed usually when not in use uh, they have to be sealed to, to make them moisture and light proof a humidity of 30 to 60 percent is required in the area, area of storage to prevent static discharges and important always store on the end of the film i'll tell you what it is and there are some automated film handling systems where the machine itself loads and loads the film into a cassette where there is no human interface at all so not those systems are also available so this is how to store films the in vertically okay they are they to be stored on end the the largest of the films closer to the support of the wall and the smaller ones uh, more distally so what what is this this is very interesting so this is a black film right this is a black film anyone can uh, guess uh, what is this black film we all have seen so it's an exposed film which is developed so then it becomes a black film what is this green film anyone can guess it what is this no guesses i guess i am seeing the chat box one is a replying so what has happened here is this this green film is uh, yeah it is not exposed but it is developed okay it is not exposed but developed that is what is important it is not exposed to either light or x-ray both and this is also kept in the viva many times so just uh, need to know what it is yeah next we'll come to intensifying screens in the radiography so most of the times it will be there in the cassettes itself sometimes the screen may have uh, they may have kept outside the cassette uh, but that's very unlikely okay most of the times they are within the cassette so along with cassette you'll be asked about the screens as well so the sensitivity of film to a direct x-rays is very low we need to know that the film uh, the sensitivity to direct x-rays is low and it is more sensitive to actually light that is the reason we have to keep them sealed all the time so direct x-rays need more radiation so only if without a requirement for screens if you are doing any x-rays you definitely require more radiation we need to know two three principles here one is luminescence that means a material which can emit light is uh, when it emits light it's called luminescence so if it emits light within 10 to the power minus 8 seconds of the x-ray exposure it's called fluorescence if it is after that it's called phosphorescence very simple definitions so these are all inorganic salts. The screens that I'm talking about, they are called phosphors. They emit light when excited by X-rays. So interesting trivia, Thomas Alva Edison was the first one who actually developed the intensifying screen. So intensifying screen uh, converts X-rays to light. So to, and uh, how much? I mean, there is a amplification. So fewer number of X-rays are converted into a larger number of uh, light photons. So that is what is the role of a screen. So a screen reduces patient dose automatically, right? So 99% of the latent image that is formed is because of the light. Okay. I'm sorry, just a minute. Yeah. Now this is how uh, this is, these are layers uh, inside the cassette. Okay. So this is the front part of the cassette, the back part of the cassette. There is a screen in the front, the phosphor. This is the film, and then there is a screen again behind it so what we are seeing is x-rays fall here light gets emitted there is a reflective layer okay the light does not pass through it but x-rays can so these reflective layers reflect the light back to the emulsion but x-rays can always pass through uh, the the reflective layer the film and strike the distal layer where the uh, photons or light photons are again produced and these are again reflected back by the reflective layer so that is the reason why you use two screens because uh, light can be produced uh, both sides because some x-rays manage to pass beyond the film as well even those are utilized in uh, creating an image so parts of an intensifying screen this diagram is more than enough uh, there is a base then there is a uh, reflective layer there is a phosphor uh, and there is a protective coating so the base is uh, the thickest one provides support it is farthest from from the film the film is placed here okay this is uh, the anti the front part of the cassette the film is placed here the base is away from the film phosphor is closer to the film 
and base is made up of either paper, cardboard, polyester. Definitely, it is radiolucent, flexible, tough inert, and it is not transparent to light. Then there is a reflecting layer made up of titanium dioxide. It intercepts the light emitted by the phosphor layer, redirects it to the film. Then the dye, uh, uh, dye is usually added into the reflecting layer to absorb any scattered light that is produced. So again, that can fog the film. So any light which is uh, going in different directions is absorbed by the using usage of this dye. And definitely, and again, there are speeds of the screen. Then there is a phosphor layer. The active layer, uh, this is the most important layer. Uh, we'll detail, we'll discuss in the next slides. So this is an active layer. It is for suspended in polyurethane. It emits light. Uh, the protective super coating plastic Yeah, is uh, everything fine? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, I'll just continue. Uh, so what uh, the thing is, uh, uh, protective super coating again with the plastic, we'll just discuss the phosphor layer in the next slide. The phosphors that are used, calcium tungstate, the older ones actually, the zinc sulfide, the newer ones are uh, the ones that are used uh, most often these days are barium lead sulfide, barium strontium sulfide, which is European activated, yttrium tantalate, nobium activated, and the rarer, the rarer screens. So when we new phosphor technology, add all this, and also phosphors that are used in CR, DR, uh, they can also be and uh, the image int intensifiers. They're all newer and uh, newer uh, phosphor technology. So the question on newer new phosphor technology, you have to write about all those things. The calcium tungstate uh, had a it's a first that was used has just a five percent conversion efficiency. I'll come to that. It's blue emission spectrum. We'll just see what it is. So there is something called screen efficiency. So it's the ability of the light emitted by the phosphor to escape the screen and expose the film. So not all the light goes to the film that is emitted by the phosphor. Only 50% of it does generally. So this is called screen efficiency. Then there is an intensification factor. So what is this? So these are the three, four things related to the screen that can be asked. Intensification factor is the exposure required without screen by exposure required with screen. To produce the same density on the film, normally it is around 30 to 50. And there is a third one called conversion efficiency, which is most often used. So it, this is the efficiency of converting X-rays into visible light. So it is only 5% for calcium tungstate, up to 20% for the rarer. So and it can be as high as 45% for this direct digital systems. So increase in conversion efficiency, increase speed. Uh, just one minute. I'll I'll just Uh, I request uh, all uh, people participating here to mute their videos. Ensure that you are not seen. Okay. I, I have a personal request for everyone. Mute, please mute your videos. Uh, Rahim sir, I request uh, if you can do that. You can do that, sir. Uh, individually, if you can just uh, scroll and mute all the videos. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that was about uh, the uh, in intensifying screens. Next, we have something called, uh, next we'll discuss about the developer solution. So what is it? A conventional radiographic film developer, it, it's available as a powder, okay, important. It's available as a powder if we are using the manual processing and it is available as a liquid if it is for automatic processors. So what is development? It's a chemical process that amplifies the latent image to form a visible silver pattern. What it means, it's very simple. Development is a reduction process. So it adds an electron to the silver ion and makes it metallic silver. So that's what we need to know in this. So the process starts at sensitivity spec. 
and the important the developing can uh, development can happen both of the exposed and unexposed grains so there should be selectivity otherwise we will not know uh, will not get a good image at all if both get developed so important to that we use the developers which have more selectivity on exposed grains the poor development will cause fog constraints of developing solution there are developer agents accelerator buffer restrainers and preservative so developing agents they are reducing agents this just supply electrons to the silver okay so most uh, they must be very selective as i told and they should have high activity most often we end up using the combination of these two it's called a pq developer which is a phenidion and a hydroquinone so what is this this graph indicates is the development time and the density on the film so hydroquinone takes a lot of time but there is a steep curve upwards okay so density will appear Phenidion also takes some time, but lesser than the hydroquinone. Again, there is a steep curve. But when both are combined, they have something called super additive effect, which is even beyond the effect uh, combined effects of both. Okay, so so that is what is super additive effect. I'll talk in this slide. Phenidion and metal, they are very quick acting. So there are usually the three things that are asked is phenidion, metal, and hydroquinone. The phenidion, metal, they are both are very quick acting. They develop all the exposed grains, but the selectivity is very low. They produce a very high pop. Hydroquinone is a much better one, but the problem is it is very uh, slow. So it require and it requires an alkaline medium, very selective but very slow. So the advantages of a combination hydroquinone and phenidione is they are high selectivity, low fogging, high tolerance to bromine ion concentration. They are adequate activity. Uh, they act, uh, their active unit very low concentrations and they are available in liquid concentrate form, especially for automatic film processors. They are very fast acting and they permit complete development within 20 to 30 minutes. So fast acting means 20 to 30 minutes. That's what we need to remember, okay, in manual processing. And there is something called super additive effect. Hydroquinone increases the effectiveness of phenidion by regenerating phenidion, which was oxidized by silver bromide. So that is how it happens. We need alkaline medium for the developers to act. So we get it with potassium carbonate, hydroxide, or borate, any one of these. The best pH is the frequently asked question 10 to 11.5. And if, uh, if it is low or high, there are some problems. Then we need a buffer to maintain the pH. So buffering is again done by carbonate sulfides. So developer cons consists of all these things. Then there are restrainers. So what is a restrainer in a developer? It is reduces the conversion of unexposed silver halide to silver, thus preventing chemical form. So this is important because unexposed silver halides must not develop. And the byproduct of development process is a potassium bromide, which itself uh, acts as a restrainer. So we don't require anything specific more than that. And a preservative is a sodium sulfite or a potassium sulfite that is used. It reduces the oxidation of developing agents. So basically, the developer agents get oxidized when they reduce the silver ions. And if we can reduce the oxidation rate of developing agents, we can have a much longer life of developer. So that is what the silver sulfite does. It reduces the oxidation of developing agents. And they, these, uh, they form uh, uh, compounds uh, uh, which are colored compounds. Basically, sorry, the developing agents usually when they oxidize will form colored compounds and uh, they will form uh, uh, basically some, <coughs> they form a suspension in the developer itself. Uh, so this is what about that and more important for uh, theory exams, I guess, uh, developer reactions. There are two types of developer reactions, high volume dependent where there is a in departments where there is a high load of x-rays. So this is what happens. Uh, the final product, the silver bromide, the halide, that is the silver halide in the film reacts with the hydroquinone and the sodium sulfide, that sulfite, that is the preservative and uh, metallic silver is formed. Sodium bromide is formed, so bromine is there, hydroquinone monosulfonate and hydrogen bromide. So this is an acid that is being produced, so it will cause problems because uh, we need an alkaline uh, area. So all this happens in the presence of an alkali. So when we have to replenish an automatic processor in a very high volume dependent uh, uh, department, what we need to include in a replenish, replenish is an alkali because there is an acid here that is being produced and we're, uh, the preservative is being used. So we need to replenish the preservative. 
then it has to be bromide free because bromide is anyway being developed so this replenisher need not have any bromide at all and developing agent also need to be replenished and then there is an oxidation dependent where there are not many cases that we are doing in our department so there's a different type of reaction that occurs hydroquinone and the same preservative oxidize to form these compounds what we have to see is sodium hydroxide is formed here so the alkaline alkaline uh, this thing is maintained uh, environment is maintained so we don't require any extra alkali here what we only require is a preservative the developer and as bromide is not uh, formed here we require bromide so the replenishment should contain these these are basically for automatic processes and developer temperature and time manual processing the best temperature is 20 degrees important to remember this what is the time so 1 is to 2 is to 3 is the simplest way to remember the time for developer fixing and washing okay so if it is in a 30 minutes 5 minutes for developing 10 for fixing 15 for washing and if you reduce it the ratio has to be maintained so 1 is to 2 is to 3 for manual processing it's slightly different in automatic processors uh, automatic processor requires slightly higher temperature and most often these days we end up uh, having a film in nine developed film in 90 seconds if you are using an automatic processor and developing times around 26 seconds in a 90 second cycle next is fixer this is a x-ray fixer okay radiographic film fixer okay so what are the functions so these packets will be kept in your table viva and you will be have you'll have to speak uh, how to prepare it is always written on the in this thing packet itself it's not a big thing um, the companies have their own way of doing it one caters for a 9 liter developer the 13.5 liter developer fixer so it varies with the companies what is important is we need to know when to add uh, water that is also mentioned uh, with individual uh, company uh, labels the function of fixer it stops any further development of the grains. It clears the image by removing the remaining silver halide from the emulsion. And it fixes the image. That is why it is called a fixer. So what, it, what do you mean by fixing the image? It makes it very stable. The image becomes very stable so that there is no further changes in the image. That's the uh, accumulated silver atoms. And to complete the process of hardening. So it has to harden the emulsion because emulsion is already... Uh, the developer has uh, gone into the emulsion and it has become so hardener is also present in developer in some companies some companies uh, only have it in the fixer the constraints main one these are the main constraints fixing agents acid hardener buffer preservative anti sludging agents fixer agent sodium ammonium thiosulfate ammonium thiosulfate is also called hypo hypo solution the advantage of these is the hypo is it's highly soluble and very high activity the fixing happens very rapidly and it forms very highly soluble byproducts so silver thiosulfides are formed which are very uh, water uh, tightly bound and water soluble and easily can be removed from the solution so that uh, silver which is not to be developed is removed from the solution itself so this is how they prevent developing the non exposed uh, silver grains and then we need an acid or a buffer to stop because developer requires uh, alkaline media so add an acid it will stop uh, working of the developer so acetic acid sodium acetate is used as an acid and a buffer preservative again can be sodium sulfide it depends on the company anti sludging agent it removes all the aluminum salts so, uh, that that may be formed uh, aluminum salts why aluminum comes here i'll talk in the next slide so aluminum salts are hardeners so they harden the gelatin and they form some compounds which the anti sludging agents remove basically so the gelatin in the emulsion has to has swollen so it has to be hardened so that it becomes stable the film so glutaraldehyde aluminum chloride sulfate they are all used so they also reduce the drying time they prevent the damage of the film so important the fixing time in auto processor is around 15 seconds so it was 26 seconds for developer 15 seconds for fixer in an automatic processor but in manual processing it is 1 is to 2 is to 3 so fixing time is more than the developing time and uh, incomplete fixing will give a cloudy film which will not be transparent will be very cloudy milky okay and incomplete washing will uh, become more brown with age because of silver sulfide which is formed by the hypo which is not washed out so this is about fixer 
I am at the end. So I thought uh, just yesterday I came about uh, this. I had not seen it for a long time. I, I thought I'll just add one slide on this before I complete today's class. What is this? This is an abdominal binder. Okay, radiographic or fluoroscopy. It's used in a radiography, fluoroscopy. Okay. So basically for compression purposes. So we use it in intravenous phylography uh, when we require compression views, compression the ureter uh, to uh, show the ureter better. The barium studies to demonstrate uh, ideocecal junctions, clinic and hepatic flexures, we, have, we can use this. But there, definitely there are some contraindications, uh, acute obstruction of the acute ureteric or even bowel obstruction, recent procedures or surgery of the abdomen. Aortic aneurysms, any trauma to the abdomen, these are all contraindications for abdominal binders. Nowadays, not frequently used, but uh, this is also part of table YY equipment. So, you just need to know this. And with this, I complete today's class. I think I am on time at 7. And these are my references, uh, questions and mostly, but uh, I uh, advise that people go through this particular book. It's amazing. I don't think it is available in the market, but definitely the older versions are available, older copies. The newer uh, versions are not there. Carlton and Adler. This is a picture perfect book for table viva. And Justney's is the book for darkroom procedures. There is no doubt about it. And so, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, listening to the class and supporting us all the time. And I would expect you to write your opinion and some experiences of yours after joining the past classes, whether it has helped or not, whether uh, we can make it any better. Please email me on this and keep supporting us as, we, as you people are doing. Uh, I think I can just take some questions. Anyway, Raheem sir is there to help me out in answering them. Yeah, someone has quoted. Uh, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm just going to the chat box now. Till now, I was not going through any of the chats that you have posted. I'm just, you can just give me a couple of minutes. Upendra, uh, I had uh, answered most of the queries of the chats. In the excellent, chat. sir. You are the best teacher. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. So, once again, I thank hope you it everyone for attending today's class. I hope it has been a fruitful uh, learning experience for you and all. And uh, it's a good experience for even the teachers also to revise and uh, be in touch with uh, the students. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, active participation. And if there are any questions, Dr. Uh, Upendra would be happy to take. Yeah, there's someone has asked on the notch on the single emulsion film. It's usually on the right upper corner of the film. So that will indicate, give you a hint that uh, which is the side which has to uh, face the uh, patient or the, uh, the tissue in question. The right hand upper corner is the way to put it. Okay. So that is one thing. So that should face the tissue basically. If you are taking intraoral radiography, the, the, the tooth that you are interested in, that particular, uh, if you can, that notch should be on the right upper corner, that's important. No, the sensitivity spec, anyway, uh, I, uh, sensitivity spec and all we can again discuss again. Uh, I request someone is sharing the screen, I request them not to do it. We have a spotter quiz coming up by Dr. Vivek. Please don't uh, share your screens as of now. So, Thank you, Raheem, sir. You have been excellent uh, in answering all the questions. I need not do much, I guess. Yeah, definitely I'll share my PPTs. Unfortunately, I have not recorded. Maybe someone else has done it for me. No, no, I have recorded it myself. Yeah, I think I have recorded it myself. Uh, and I'll stop the recording now.